Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Welcome to our Sabbath afternoon Torah study and prayer service. Hope you're all well and blessed to the Most High. My name's Ovadia, and I'm with Sabbath Keepers Fellowship. Um, our co-host today is Lisa, my wife, the director of SKF. She'll be moderating the study and service today, and once again taking your questions and comments, both from Zoom and the YouTube chat. Uh, we're beginning a new Torah cycle. And this week is Parshoth Breshith, the Torah portion in the beginning from Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 6, 8. It, it's always a great time to start the Torah anew. It's wonderful to finish it. It's wonderful in the middle. But uh, we love beginning it and starting over again. Every year, learning something new from the Word of the Most High. Since this is the beginning of a cycle, uh, I'm hoping to give a little bit of an overview uh, for you to help you understand a little bit more of the commandments, why we need to keep them, uh, and what the scriptures have to say about that. Uh, the, t the lesson today is on Parshoth Breshith, uh, but before we get started, let's have a prayer. Father Yahweh, we come before your throne. We thank you so much for this day, this day of rest. Rest and gathering, a micro kodesh, a set-apart gathering of your people. Some of us are in places where we we can't gather together physically, Abba. Or at least not where we'd like to, or with all those we'd like to. We ask you to soon make it possible that we can all do that. And in the meantime, please accept our humble efforts at gathering in your name, sharing your word, fellowshipping, and having a day of rest together. We ask you to open our hearts and our minds and our eyes to see wonderful things from your Torah. In Yahushua's name, Amen. Uh, for the lesson today, again, beginning with Breshith, which is one word in Hebrew, it's a compound word, and it means in the beginning. In the beginning is a great place to start, uh, rather than somewhere else. Unlike most books, a lot of people tend to start in the middle or towards the end of the book, which is just a silly thing. We're starting right where we're supposed to, at the beginning, the very beginning. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, our Elohim, who gives us the Torah. Uh, the title, Breshith, from uh, our Torah portion, is the first significant word, in fact, it's the very first word, in the Torah, in the scriptures. Uh, and it's from... Uh, the, again, the, uh, the study is chapters 1, uh, 1 through 6, 8. And that first verse says, Breshith bara Elohim et Hashemayim et Haretz, which means, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The parasha is about the creation of the universe, the world, specifically of mankind, it details the events of the descendants of the first man, Adam, up to the great time of the Great Flood. Uh, there, uh, of the commandments, we'll be studying uh, first the, uh, the command that is found uh, in, the, in the 613 as given by the Rambam, Moshe ben Mamon, and according to most scholars. Uh, it is... And there are only one, or is only one, to have children with one's wife. Breshith 128, which says, And Elohim blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over all the creeping creatures on the earth. Now, 
uh, on the face of it, that sounds like a lot more than one command, and it could easily be, easily be split into several. Uh, to be fruitful, increase, multiply, have children, uh, and fill the earth, uh, to subdue it as well as fill it, and to rule over the fish and the birds and over all the creatures on the earth. Each of those could be construed as an independent command. However, the Rambam sums them up, and uh, it's uh, it was the only command given to Adam uh, in the garden. Uh, well, save one other that is not counted, but it's the only one which is counted, and the only one that's... Uh, Acknowledged within the entirety of those first six, cha six chapters of the, well, five and some chapters of the Torah. Uh, I don't think that the command needs much other explanation. Uh, it's a command to have children, if possible, if you can, if you're able, and if you have the opportunity. Obviously, if you can't or don't, uh, the command can't be construed as binding upon you. But we're not to sit static in our families, in our communities. We're to grow and increase. And every time that a new child is born and brought into our communities, we increase the people in the kingdom of the Most High. So it's a great command. And that's the only one that's counted by uh, the rabbis in the parashah. There are, uh, by my count, three uncounted, uncounted commandments in Parshoth Breshith. Uh, they are, one, that Adam and Kava should not eat from the tree of knowledge of excellence and evil. This comes from Breshith, Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And it says, and Yahweh Elohim commanded the man, saying, Eat of every tree in the garden, but do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of excellence and evil. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely or certainly die. Now, the reason that this command was not counted by Moshe ben Maimon, the Rambam, uh, is that it was a one-time command uh, for Adam and Kava, Eve, in the Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. And so it's not, uh, it's not binding upon us. You could spiritualize it and find uh, ways to honor that command uh, yourself uh, as you think best, but the physical command is, of course, no longer possible. There's uh, somewhat of a barrier between us and Gan Eden at present. And uh, we won't have access to that place again until the Olam Haba, uh, after the Messianic reign. The second uncounted commandment uh, is that uh, man shall rule over woman. Uh, I'm sure that will uh, cause a bit of controversy among you. I didn't write it. The Most High did. Uh, Boreshi 3.16 says to the woman, he said, I greatly increase your sorrow in your, in your conception. Bring forth children in pain and your desires for your husband and he does rule over you. Uh, it's a, certainly a command. That's how the Most High set up the world and the universe and uh, our responsibility is to obey it not rebel against, explain away, or dispute it. Uh, how that is done, he doesn't say. And, of course, between any two human beings, a relationship should be two ways. Uh, you decide how to work that out. I know that the writings of the apostles... Uh, say that uh, a man should treat his wife as the Messiah treats his bride. And I think that that is the, probably, I, I can't speak for the Most High, nor for his Messiah, but I do believe that that is the reason this command was given. 
so that we have that model, that pattern, that idea, something to relate to. And indeed, uh, while a man is commanded to rule over woman or his wife, uh, that should be to her advantage more so than his. Uh, being in a leadership position while coveted by many is not the most comfortable it's not the best place to be. It's usually, most often, not a fun place to be. Uh, that means that the man cares for his wife, just like Messiah cares for us. He gives her everything, even his life, if necessary. Uh, that she should be showered with excellent things and the best treat treatment that a, a person could ever hope for. Uh, I don't think that's a disadvantage to her at all. In any case, that's the, the uncounted commandment. The second and the third would be uh, that man will labor intensely to produce food, uh, the plants of the field. Breshi 3.17-19 through 19 says... Cursed is the ground because of you, and toil you to eat of it all your day, all the days of your life. And the ground shall bring forth thorns and thistles for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you are to eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you'll return. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean, you could say that was another advantage to being a woman that uh, a man for his part uh, he's going to toil and sweat to earn his living uh, a hard life for him he shoulders the responsibility for the family he pays the price when anything goes awry which with much responsibility uh, much is required. Uh, those are the total of four commandments given in all of Parshath Breshith, uh, five plus chapters of the Torah. Not a lot, <clears throat> but uh, in Yahweh's wisdom, that's what he chose to give us in the beginning. Now why would that be so? Why not just lay out the entirety of the Torah uh, from the outset for mankind? What's he, what he expects of us? Well, I think we'll get into that. Since we just got started today and we have, I mean we're in the beginning after all, and uh, we have a little extra time, uh, I'm thinking that uh, we'll talk a little bit about those commandments, why they were given, the way they were given, at least insofar as we can know that. Uh, I have a few uh, uh, notes I'd like to explore with you on the subject, and it'll help us begin this cycle of Torah reading and put things in perspective for you, I hope. Uh, right in the beginning in the beginning uh, well let me back up before the beginning Yahweh was alone, uh, but he was complete, unique, whole. So why creation? Uh, everything that could potentially ever be was within him, and there was nothing outside of him. He's absolutely one, according to Scripture and the commandment. 
So why create the universes at all? Why people? I thought of an example. And poor as it may be, I hope it gives you an idea of what I'm trying to what I'm trying to express to you. I used to go to this place. I used to live in the mountains, pretty high up, uh, well over seven thousand feet. And I had an old motorcycle, an Indian, uh, 48, 47 model. And uh, I wore a flyer's cap, and uh, before you had, had to wear a helmet. Uh, I've been around a while. And uh, goggles, and uh, this old Indian motorcycle, leather coat, and chaps, and I would go out in the mountains on the fire roads and deer paths and game trails, and, and I'd pass these uh, other fellas uh, and some gals, even back then on their motorcycles who were riding around in the hills and doing some dirt racing and whatnot. And they'd, <laughs> they'd look at me and say, look at the old fella go on the Indian. Yeah, I was about 30. <laughs> but I used to go out and explore. I used to say I was trying to go get lost. And, I, and sometimes I did. And obviously, I always found my way back. I mean, found my way somewhere. I'm here. But I... Uh, I would go as far out as I could to the most remote places and uh, eventually I found a spot uh, deer paths and it was about 8,000 feet up uh, wind blowing and it was always cool or cold <clears throat> and I, I went off the even off the deer trails and out into the rocks I saw uh, a, a mountain peak and, and then a big nothing uh, between myself and it and I rode out to the end of these rocks and I found this place uh, that was these the rocks were house sized uh, huge and they were set up in this like one on each side and one behind and a flat one on a cliff looking over a valley was probably 5,000 feet below pristine uh, trees and uh, some water and not a human or even an animal uh, occasional eagle uh, it was near an eagle preserve nothing in sight but but nature and the wind and the sky and uh, it was beautiful and it was absolute solitude and I would I park my old bike and then walk a little further down and, and sit in this place sometimes for hours sometimes I spent the night and uh uh, just thinking, sometimes praying, and uh, and just being there. And it was so beautiful. I mean, it was one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. And it, it seemed to be mine. I was by myself there. And I did that time after time, and it was my getaway spot. But there was always something lacking. Even though it seemed... Everything was whole and complete right there. Uh, it, it was just me. There, there's something greater than whole and completeness inside oneself. And, and that's what this kingdom of the Most High is in, in Jerusalem and in Israel. And it's what it's all about. And I... I don't know if this is true, but I can only imagine why would Yahweh make a creation? Was he lonely? I, I don't know. But I do know that he wanted to share it. And I, I finally, uh, not long before I left that place, uh, I, I started um, being sad that I... I uh, I had nobody to share that with. I, I never took anyone there. Uh, and without sharing it, it wasn't truly complete. That's my thinking, my idea on maybe why, uh, why creation. Uh, not so much that Yahweh was lonely. Uh, well, I don't know, maybe he was, but 
He wanted to share it and give it because until you do that, there's not nearly the joy uh, that you could have. So that place was, uh, as Yahweh called the creation when he finished, it was Tov Meod. It was very excellent, but it wasn't Tamim, complete, whole. And that's the difference. Sharing is perfection to give away, to give to others, to have mercy, uh, to get outside yourself. And since we know Yahweh is perfect, absolutely perfect, uh, how could he desire any less? So, in the beginning, Yahweh created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, there was division, chaos. Tohu and bohu, uh, formlessness, chaos, darkness, a blank slate. Essentially, nothing done with it, no rules, no people, chaos and confusion. Uh, a tablet to write on, if you will. And write what? Uh, well, the very first thing he wrote, in fact, that he spoke, was a word. Uh, the solution to all the problems that were going to come with creation uh, was given before uh, the problems even had a chance to, to manifest themselves. You see, Yahweh was perfect in his oneness. But when creation was made, it was not going to be perfect. It was not going to be him. Uh, I don't know that he could create another one of himself, and if he could, why would he want to? And I don't. that's getting into deeper philosophical stuff than I want to go, uh, especially today. But um, to create a universe that is not one in a whole, but it's divided, is going to create problems. It's going to be imperfect. And if it is imperfect... Uh, when bad things, where bad things can happen, they will happen. Uh, that's the nature of things outside of the sphere of the Most High. There are going to be problems, and if he wanted to create a, a people that could be his, and that he could share uh, his immenseness and his mercy and his love with, uh, they were going to be less than perfect less than himself, and so they would create problems. And, well, Yahweh knows the end from the beginning, right? And so the first thing he did was create the solution to those problems. From the, out of the darkness came light, in Hebrew, or, uh, order, structure, a single vision and purpose, uh, everything that comes next has to be made to end in this perfection, which had to be Messiah. So the solution was created before the problem. What kind of order? What did he do? Well, he set in place a structure within the universe, uh, power, in order to accomplish his will. And the Messiah certainly tapped into it. Uh, much of it came with a word. Uh, and it was named the light. In order to have that structure, there has to be rules. You have to have boundaries, and things have to be set up in order to function a certain way. Uh, and what would that be? Well, you can call it a law. Uh, and when he created man, and put him in the garden, and knew things would fall and fail eventually, he gave him one simple commandment, be fruitful and multiply. And then another, don't eat from that tree, knowing full well that the worst probably, almost certainly, would happen. And uh, he had everything else planned from that point on. So... Everything was idyllic. It was just like it needed to be. 
and mankind spoiled it, as we usually do. Did he know they would? Of course he did. He knows the end from the beginning, prepared for it, his law, regardless of the stage at which it was given in any age or era, at any time during uh, the, the existence of the universe, for that matter, but for mankind, during the existence of mankind in particular, uh, his law was exactly what it needed to be in that moment or time, regardless of what stage. It was perfect for its time, necessary for its time. So man was first given one commandment and then another, and then he spoiled it. And the earth became, uh, of course, we're getting ahead of this Torah portion, but as you know, the earth became a bad place. And more laws were eventually given after a little cleansing. The revelation of Yahweh, what I'm trying to tell you is the revelation of Yahweh is progressive. It's not a static thing. It's not, it's not stuck. Uh, it wasn't, well, he gives, gives it to us a little bit at a time so as not to overwhelm us. It unfolds slowly, like the petals of a beautiful flower. The events between each new revelation serve to illustrate the reasons and the need for the next. An excellent example of this is the instructions of Yahweh regarding food. And this comes later, of course. But in Gan Eden, the garden, Adam and Kava were told to eat of all the trees in the garden, and all the plant life was to be food for them. No mention was made of animals uh, at that time. Uh, then after the flood, Noah was told that animals would also be food. Any living thing that moved was to be food for the nations that he fathered, at least for a time. Uh, in due course, Yisrael was born at Mount Sinai. Certain additional restrictions uh, were imposed upon them regarding what would be permitted as food. Uh, the Torah commands uh, were then enhanced and expanded. Uh, they increased. These additional restrictions, uh, restrictions are, they were to function as a sign upon this special chosen people <clears throat> of Yahweh who were to be set apart for him uh, as a nation of priests to the rest of the world. Uh, this, it was absolutely necessary to further the plan and the process of of finishing, completing, setting apart the people who would be his. So, with that as an example, likewise, the rest of the commandments of Yahweh for his people revealed in an orderly progression. Be fruitful and multiply. Don't eat from that tree. Oops, we broke those. We might need a few more now. Uh, He's not given all of the commands to mankind at once or to his people at once, nor are they all applicable to every person. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of people and lots of different kinds of situations and with differing requirements and needs. Uh, the first were simply, as I said, be fruitful and multiply, and the other uh, about the tree. Uh, the next one, Noah was given a few basic commands that were to apply to all of humanity, all of his children. Uh, uh, some people say it was four, some people say it was seven, and depending on you, how you count. And we'll get into that next week with Parshat Noach. But uh, about a thousand years later at Mount Sinai, Moshe was given the ten great commands, uh, which the people promptly broke uh, within less than 40 days. And, uh, or about 40 days, and he went back up the mountain and was given over 600 others, most of which were to apply to the children of Israel alone at that time. All of these progressive, progressively uh, revealed instructions, restrictions, commandments are irrevocable and binding forever according to Yahweh. Each was accompanied by a solemn covenant made between the parties involved, none has ever been replaced or rescinded. Rather than replacing the old, successive revelations uh, add to and expand upon one another, each teaching us <clears throat> more about our Father and our Creator in Heaven. 
about his future plans for us with him. Uh, this state of affairs is prophesied to remain so until the day that Messiah returns to reign on earth. Uh, and then the plan will come to its inevitable, complete, and perfect conclusion. It will be finished, truly finished, and to mean whole and complete. Now, the revelations of the Most High are progressive. Are they now closed in this day and age? Well, it seems so, but I'm not the one to say. I'm not in the place uh, of one who decides, and I certainly am glad of that. Uh, Yahweh knows. And if he has more for us, he'll give it to us. But those people argue about which commands apply to who and when, and if they're done away with or not, uh, all fruitless arguments. Uh, really. He's given us what he's given. And different commandments apply to different people. Some in different times. Some were just a one-off thing. They were done one time and never to be repeated. Some, uh, some are for all time. Some are for all people. So my question to you has to be, do you even know which of the commandments of Yahweh apply to you? Do you know what they're for and how to keep them? Have you learned this yet? If you do and have, then you know who you are before the Most High. This law, this rule, this organization, this way that he's given you to walk, given us to walk, defines us who we are before the Most High. And it's not one of confusion. And it's certainly not one of lawlessness. As you know, people are going to make all kinds of claims on that day that Messiah returns. They healed the sick. They raised the dead. They did miracles. And he's going to say to those who didn't keep his Torah, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. So, if you know and you practice his commandments, you know who you are before him. Either one of the greater commonwealth of Israel or one of the unbelieving nations. Those are the choices. There, aren't, well, there isn't one in between. One of his chosen people or an unsaved heathen. Uh, one who will be with Yehoshua is coming or one who will rise later to stand judgment. If you don't know, you must learn. Because regardless of whether you know it now or not, your actions define your future, who you are now and who you will be. If I can teach you anything about the Torah and about the commandments, that would be it. And there's one thing uh, of which you can be absolutely certain absolutely certain Yahweh knows he knows the end from the beginning all that remains for you is a decision to, who are you going to be what are you going to be before him will you be part of the perfect whole and complete future he's planned that he's designed uh, for those he'll share it with or not Listen, we're all saved into the kingdom of the Most High by grace through the death and resurrection of Messiah Yeshua. Yeshua. This is the free gift that Yahweh has given to us, paid for by the blood of Messiah for all the world who choose to accept it. But that's not the end of the story. Once saved, if we truly love him, we have a duty to turn from our sin and rebellion and walk according to his commandments, uh, as his children ought to do. 
in obedience, grateful for the salvation he's given to us. I have some scriptures for this. Scripture says, Fear Yahweh and keep his commandments, for that's the whole duty of mankind. Uh, that word mankind is not the children of Israel, it's not the disciples, it's not the Christians, it's not the Jews, it's Adam, mankind, all of mankind. And each of uh, we who belong to mankind, that is everybody who's listening to me, has uh, some rules and responsibility under the Torah, under his law. Uh, they're not all the same for each of us. I'm not a woman. I'm not a leper. I'm not a priest. I'm not a king. Uh, I'm not a farmer, a woodcutter. And so the laws uh, for those people don't apply to me. However, there are others that, the vast majority of them, which do apply to me. And I'm responsible for those. I don't get to just make it up as I go along. Grace is not a device by which we are free to sin or through which we're free to sin. And sin is the transgression of the law. That's clear from Scripture. Sin is not something we define. And if you ever want to find out what a no-law, an antinomian person uh, really want to find out what their game is, when they start talking to you about sin, ask them to define it. It'll be interesting to see, to hear the answers you get. Now, the Torah commands us, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh is our Elohim, Yahweh Echad, Yahweh is one. And you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Messiah Yeshua told us, this is the first and greatest command, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the Torah and the prophets. That second one is from Waikra, Leviticus 19.18. And those two commands combined, and the reason they're the greatest, is they sum up your whole duty of keeping commandments. The first one is vertical, as some people describe it your duty, and to love the Most High. And the other is horizontal, the people, your neighbors, your fellow, uh, all of mankind. All of mankind who, <laughs> any of those, uh, excluding those who you always said you're not to love but to um, be in opposition to. In any case, uh, it sums up love for others. Him first and others. And he doesn't apparently allow one without the other. Messiah also said, if you love me, guard my commands. I don't know how I could get much clearer than that. Um, I've heard some people, well, the rest of the verse, I, and I shall ask the Father, and he shall give you another helper to stay with you forever. Uh, the Spirit of Truth, capital T, capital Tav, whom the world is unable to receive because it does not see him or know him. This Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh that he speaks of, the Helper, uh, is that which truly enables us to keep his commands and guides us into all truth. Uh, Pilate once asked Messiah uh, himself, uh, what is truth? Yeshua didn't answer him uh, because it would have been pointless. And the prophecy said he'd keep his mouth shut. But the psalmist answers the question. Uh, in Psalm 119, uh, 
Verse 142, it says, Thy Torah is truth. Uh, the apostle said, uh, would have been Yohanan, John, and by this we know that we know him if we guard his commands. The one who says I know him and does not guard his commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever guards his word, truly the love of Elohim has been perfected in him. By this we know that we're in him. The one who says he stays in him ought to also walk even as he walked. And how did he walk? According to all that was written in the Torah. <clears throat> to walk in Hebrew, the word is halak, means walk. Uh, it was used of men walking. It was used of the angel that led and followed the people of Israel through the wilderness before Pharaoh. Uh, and it, it also means, uh, it's an idiom, which means uh, how you walk out the commands how you perform them, how you do that, your method, the details, maybe details that aren't given in the Torah specifically. Halakha is the noun derived from that word. So to walk as he walked is to follow his halakha, to follow the way he walks out the word. In Yermiyahu, uh, the New Covenant, which uh, folks often quote. Well, that's not true. Most folks nowadays, uh, and folks from other faiths, when they talk about a New Covenant, they think they're talking about the New Testament. And uh, that's what they've been taught. But the New Covenant specifically is found in the book of Yermiyahu, Jeremiah, in chapter 31. And it says, See, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I shall make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehudah, Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I strengthened their hand to bring them out of the land of Mitzrayim, Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, declares Yahweh. For this covenant I shall make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts and I shall be their Elohim and they shall be my people. And no longer shall they teach each other and his or his neighbor, one is after his neighbor, uh, and each one his brother, saying, Know Yahweh, for they all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them, declares Yahweh, for I shall forgive their iniquities, remember their sin no more. He's going to write the Torah on our hearts. We'll have it inside, all of it, every word, every bit of his teaching. And that means whatever he decides that will be, Torah meaning teaching. And as I said, his laws are progressive. If he adds more later, that's his, uh, that's his option. If he wants to include other things in that uh, that we find in Scripture or elsewhere, that's his option. He's the creator of the universe. He gets to decide. But it will be written on our hearts. Now, anyone who tells you, well, I don't have to keep the commandments. The Torah is written on my heart. Or I know how to keep the commandments. Or I do what's right. What they mean is right in their own mind. And they say that because they're not right in their own mind. <laughs> uh, if it's written on their hearts, ask them to quote it to you. They should certainly be able to do that. And when they can't, there's no words you need to say to them. Uh, it would probably be best just to walk away. Anyone that won't learn such a thing or admit such a thing. Look, uh, I've, been, I've been doing this a long time. I've begged and pleaded and studied and memorized and torn the word apart and put it back together trying to understand it. And I have, 
I have some of it written on my heart. I, I know I can quote it to you, and I and I do some of those things. Other parts I don't yet have written on my heart. I can't recite to you the entire Torah. I don't get his commandments perfect. I'm not ever going to try and persuade you that I do. I'm just like you. I may be a few steps ahead of you. I may be a few steps behind you. I don't know. But some of it's written on my heart, and I can quote it, and I'll tell you that I'm trying real hard, and with the power of his spirit, I'm able to do more than I ever would have imagined. But someday, he's going to write all of it on my heart. And I'll be able to do his Torah, and I am looking so forward to that day. Uh, the prophet Yekezkel, Ezekiel, uh, gives a second witness to what Yermiyahu said, Jeremiah said. He said, in chapter 36 of his book, And I shall give you a new heart, and put a new spirit within you. And I shall take the heart of stone out of your flesh, and I shall give you a heart of flesh, and put my spirit, uh, ruhi, my spirit, within you. And I shall cause you to walk in my laws and guard my judgments and shall do them. And you shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers and you shall be my people and I shall be your Elohim. It doesn't get any better than that. And it's pretty clear. This is prophecy of the future. Uh, of our own time maybe and certainly of Yami Maharim, the days that come after. The end times, if you like. Paul of Tarsus sums up the, the entire matter by telling us, So then, brothers, we're not debtors to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Uh, I would say that is in sin and righteousness, according to the flesh not according to the Torah and the commandments. For if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you, are put, you put to death the deeds of the body of the flesh, which is sin, you shall live. Paul's the one that most people uh, use, twisting his words, to say the Torah is not applicable to us anymore. And he's also one that said, uh, do we nullify the Torah uh, by grace? Certainly not. We establish the Torah. After he uh, talks about us, Paul that is, of Tartus, talks about not living according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, which is never, ever in conflict with the written word. He tells us this, giving us hope. He says, for I'm persuaded <laughs> for I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor messengers, angels, nor principalities, nor powers, neither the present nor the future, nor height nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Elohim, which is in Messiah Yeshua, our Master. Paul was a great scholar of the scriptures. Before he encountered the Spirit of the Most High and Yeshua uh, on the highway and converted. He was a great rabbi. He studied at the feet of Gamliel, who was historically uh, an immense figure in, in Jewish lore. Uh, Paul knew the scriptures. He knew all the writings. Uh, he had invested his entire life from childhood in the understanding of these things and in righteousness as best he knew it uh, both before and after uh, he came to Yeshua and through all his learning and through the spirit of the Most High 
and through the teachings of Yeshua, he came to that conclusion. Nothing would separate us from the love of Elohim, of Yahweh, uh, which is in us, uh, or for us, in Messiah Yeshua, our Master. He also said, The eyes not seen and the ears not heard, nor have entered into the heart of man what Elohim has prepared for those who love him. Uh, he loves us with an everlasting love, y'all. This Torah, these commandments, are not hurtful. They're not a burden if you love him. They're a joy to keep. Conforming yourself to the likeness of Messiah is not a chore. It's not a curse. It's not a hardship. I'm not saying it's easy all the time. Uh, warring against the flesh and, and against the world to behave like our Messiah. Hey, look, he wasn't accepted in his day in a, in a land full of Torah observance of one kind or another. Uh, it's not easy. But it, it's not impossible. And you have the power of the Spirit of the Most High to enable you to keep these commands. Uh, to become who you are and should be in Messiah. In the beginning, Braishith, the start of a new cycle of Torah reading. As we learn and begin to practice the Torah and commandments uh, together, uh, we'll be conforming ourselves to the likeness of Messiah, our teacher and master. That's who we're called to be, the people of the Most High and heirs of the kingdom. So, in the beginning, we've begun. We can do this together. Uh, I guess it's uh, time for some question and answers. Well, there's Lisa. Hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing we might have a few. You know, I've never, uh, never been through this Torah portion with folks when there wasn't lots of questions and even pretty often some controversy and uh, it's a hard thing to understand uh, one thing that uh, I like to tell people before we even get started with questions and answers on the subject is uh, a lot of people uh, and, and I, I tried to at one time try to take the the creation accounts and make them a history or, or a chronicle, uh, a science book on, on how these things were done and uh, how many days were creation and um, uh, how long a period that might be and how it was gone about. And, um, excuse me, that's not what the Torah is trying to teach us. And that's not the purpose of the book. It gives us an overview so we're not ignorant of these things. And because, excuse me, because it gives background uh, to the rest of the story. But the Torah, uh, the scriptures altogether, uh, are, aren't just a history book. They're a teaching and the story of a people, what they went through, who they were supposed to be, are supposed to be, and who they should and will become. That's what the scriptures are. And I hope those are the kinds of questions we get today. Who do you have? Well, uh, Caleb had a question uh, about um, unwritten, well, whether or not the commandments were written down. Caleb, you want to ask a question? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Uh, my question Shalom, was... Caleb. Shalom. Shabbat shalom. 
Shabbat Shalom. Uh, my question is more like, are there some commandments? We obviously haven't gotten to know it yet, but by his time, he knew that there were clean and unclean animals without it being mentioned. And here we find Cain and Abel offering sacrifices when sacrifice was never really mentioned. It was never commanded as far as we know. And one sacrifice is approved while the other one is not. So it raises the question, were there commandments that were given that were not written down for us, but were given to them? Nice way to sum up two or three questions into one. Mm, um, you're welcome. Uh, the correct answer uh, for anyone to give you on that, uh, about that, is uh, I don't know. How could I possibly know? Because... Um, I've, you know, I have the same materials available uh, to me that uh, you and everyone else does. So I can't, and, and if anyone would tell you that they do know the, the truth of that, just tr get away from that person. That's, um, we have ideas and we can, we can put together conclusions based upon uh, a few facts and the rest of it is inductive reasoning, Right. You know, we, yeah. we take these things and we make some assumptions and put them together in the conclusion. Uh, it, it's quite obvious that they were aware of how to do sacrifices. Well, that was a pretty common thing in those times, right? I mean, you know, it's historically we found altars from uh, just about every faith you can imagine in the, in the region and, they, and all over the planet for that matter. Uh, even the Mayans and, and other folks uh, used sacrifice as part of their ritual. So it was a common thing. How it came to be understood, I don't know. Did the Most High tell them to do that? Did he instruct Adam or his uh, children uh, about animal sacrifice? I don't know. Maybe they decided that was a, a cool thing on their own. Hey, you know, we can do this vicarious thing. I don't want to die or be punished, so we'll offer up the goat because it's all we have. And, and I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you know, your question borders on uh, the one we had from last week about the oral Torah or the oral law. Uh, were there things given uh, orally that we're not aware of? Well, apparently so but not absolutely. We can't absolutely know that. All we can do is reason and, and uh, infer that from what we have. Does that help? Does that answer it? Or sure. did I just kind of kind of avoid the question? <laughs> if there's uh, no you know, answer, avoid. <laughs> th yeah, apparently um, it was understood that the animal sacrifice was uh, uh, pleasing to the Most High and the grain offering wasn't. It doesn't say that, but I, it's hard to draw any other conclusion from the from the text. Um, Unless there was murder in the heart of one and not in the other. I don't know because it doesn't say that either. It, it I mean, after the fact, uh, after the his sacrifice was rejected, yeah, Cain uh, definitely had murder in his heart and in his hands. Prior to that, there's no way to know, you know, was it sibling rivalry as, you know, as usual? Well, you know, that's entirely possible, but uh, we can't know exactly what was it. And, you know, that, uh, Caleb, that brings up something that we encounter all the time. People assume they know the heart of another person. Yeah, you can't. You, you can see from what they do, and uh, not only what they say, but even more from what they do, how they live and behave, usually after a period of time, what, what is apparently in the heart of a person, in a man, but, uh, or a woman. But <clears throat> you can't know for certain, and we need to be careful about that. I hope that answers your question. Got any others? Sure. While I have you on the line nope. here, okay. there's quite a few that I could ask, but I we'd be here all day. Oh, this this parish hour is so chock full of uh, of of things. Um, Jumps through quite a few hundred years, so yeah, yeah, and uh, quite a few pages. Uh, 
over five chapters. Uh, and in the beginning, we get loaded down with uh, a lot of stuff to cover. And it, it's, it's hard to pick, you know, which thing to speak. We can't talk about all of it. We, like you say, we'd be here for days, really. Uh, months, who knows. But in any case, uh, great question, and uh, I don't know the answer. Okay. Uh, Jackie had a question. She wants to know what was wrong with Cain's offering. Well, uh, and she she doesn't want to uh, show us her face and ask that herself. That's okay. Um, I can, if you'd like. Hi, Jackie. Shalom. Hey. Shalom. Um, excellent um, question. I pondered that myself. All right. all right. What do you think? Um, I guess I was just wondering, was it the offering it, itself or was it his attitude? Um, just I've heard other people's theories on it. And I guess I was just curious if you guys had an idea if it was just more his attitude the way he offered it or uh or if it was actually the offering itself mm -hmm. no that that's an excellent question um i struggled for a long time trying to find the answer to that uh you know decades ago and uh, have looked into it uh, other times when i thought maybe i i found a hint somewhere uh it doesn't say in scripture, like Caleb's question, and like a lot of uh, the the questions that come up about this Torah parasha and uh, the early parts of the of the Torah, uh, the answers aren't given. Uh, it doesn't say why, uh, and it. But it seems, I mean, at least to me, that uh, the Torah expects us to already know this. Do you get that feeling? Just the way it says, yeah. you know, hey, well, obviously he was, re you know, his offering was rejected. Well, it's not obvious to me why. Uh, from the context of scripture, uh, animal sacrifices uh, were the most common. And uh, a grain offering was not allowed uh, unless a person was... I mean, unless it was commanded in addition to uh, an animal sacrifice. But a, a standalone grain offering, uh, well, there's a few things about them. They're for the poor, people who can't afford uh, uh, an animal sacrifice. And because they are, they're, they're also the most precious to the Most High and uh, are most set apart rather than just set apart. So if it was that the Most High, in the case of uh, Cain and Hevel, Cain and Abel, if it was uh, that uh, he preferred the animal sacrifice over the grain offering, I wouldn't necessarily understand why, unless, like Caleb was saying, there was some teaching behind the scenes that we don't know about, uh, or that was common in those days, that uh, just indicated you you didn't do a grain offering you you did an animal sacrifice uh, or there's always a possibility that uh, uh, the grain offering uh, maybe he could afford more than that and he was being stingy uh, with what he had uh, or if it was established he was going contrary to the rules I don't know the answer. Those are the possibilities I've considered and a few more that are a little, are a little bit more uh, uh, improbable. But that's the best I can tell you. Uh, it's, I would guess it's one of those two things, but I don't know. The text doesn't tell us. Some of uh, some great thinkers, scholars, rabbis, and others who aren't rabbis, have speculated or even uh, decided what the reason was. But uh, for the most part, they're going on no more information than you and I have. So okay. there you have it. Anything else? Thank you. Um, it that's wasn't it. much of an that answer, sorry. <laughs> no, it was good, it was good. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
Um, Sue, also from uh, YouTube, had a comment that I wanted to share. She says, when I first came to Torah, I felt overwhelmed. But as I learned, I fell in love with it and my desire is towards it. I'm so grateful that he called me to this walk and to love him. So, you know, I think I feel that way. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's lovely. And I, I think, I think my opinion, and I, I'll always try to be careful uh, to tell you when something's a fact, a scripture, or, or just my opinion. In my, my opinion, that indicates that she truly has the spirit of the Most High because uh, I don't think a person could feel like that unless they did. And <clears throat> I mean, the natural man thinks that the, the law is a burden. It's a yoke. It's a, a curse, they call it. Uh, the only time that the Torah is a curse is when you incur its curses. When you, when you disobey it, uh, you, I mean, it's cause and effect. These things were put in effect uh, by the Most High and with the people of Israel and uh, if you do this, you're going to be blessed. If you do this, you're going to be cursed. And if you consider the Torah a burden and you won't do it and refuse to do it, you're going to incur that curse. And that's rough. That's what uh, the apostles meant when they spoke of the curse of the Torah. Uh, for those who love him, uh, his word is precious. And it becomes easy. The yoke is easy. The burden's light. Uh, the spirit, the spirit, uh, the Ruach HaKodesh carries the burden and enables you to do that thing which for you before was impossible. Um, now, right. according to scripture, we've only got an earnest uh, down payment of the Ruach HaKodesh at this point. Uh, we're not perfected yet, not entirely, at least not on this earth and not certainly not in the flesh. Uh, so we'll err, we'll err, we'll make mistakes. We'll stumble, but hope we will, hopefully we won't fall. And uh, as uh, as Paul said in another place, all creation groans and longs for his coming. And we look forward to that day when we can be perfected. Any other questions? Right. Right. Um, I don't see any other questions. Well, uh, let's see, Robert had a question. Uh, I'll, we'll let him uh, turn on his audio and, and ask his question. Okay. Right, thank you. Yes, um, we're talking about Cain's offering and Cavell's offering. And uh, you know, I just made an observation, basically, that uh, did they need a command to do this? Or would that have been an innate desire to grow closer to the most high excellent question um absolutely no they didn't require a command for that why should they mm -hmm. i mean uh only if there was a command against it and we don't know of any uh, uh i don't want to get into next week's parashat you know to, to provide an answer mm -hmm. to that any more than i already have but uh no i mean uh, if if they understood uh, and, or expressed the reasons for their sacrifice and made that offering trying to draw nearer to the Most High, which, was, which is what the sacrifices are about. Uh, they're not a perfect solution. They don't fix everything. And, and all they can be is a symbol, uh, an outward manifestation of what's in one's heart. Uh, but no, they, they don't need a command to do that. And I, I, I think, uh, maybe even believe that uh, animal sacrifice was well, historically, uh, and I've done a little study on these things, uh, they were done by nearly every culture on earth. Uh, the idea came up somewhere. And they use that medium in order to uh, 
uh, make an offering to the Most High. And as we see, yeah, he accepted one and rejected the other, which means it wasn't the sacrifice, doing a sacrifice it's, uh, in and of itself that was the problem. Uh, it was the, the heart and the actions of the offer that was at, at fault. So, yeah, they, they wouldn't need a commandment. Um, <laughs> if we have to be commanded uh, to do every act of obeisance and uh, praise and, and worship and uh, in everything we try to do to draw near to the Most High, uh, then then what is that? <laughs> the book will be a lot larger than it is. Well, yeah, it would. But um, what would that say about us if we needed to command it every time we wanted mm -hmm. to do something express ourselves uh, and our love for the most high well anyway thanks for your question robert and uh yeah okay i am um, i'm not seeing any other questions so whenever we're ready we can go to prayers okay all right uh i see there are uh, quite a few people here today and I, I, I want to thank all of you for coming. Um, and you know, if you have any other questions, uh, comments, or uh, just get them to us. You know how to do that. And uh, I just appreciate your coming, and so uh, I'm looking forward to you praying with us. So let's have a prayer. Baruch Shem Arba Hayah Olam Baruch Hu. Baruch Shemo. It's an excellent thing to give thanks unto Yahweh, and to sing praises unto thy name, O El Yon. To declare thy loving kindness in the morning, and thy faithfulness every night, with an instrument of ten strings, and with a harp, with thoughtful music upon the lyre. For thou, Yahweh, hast made me rejoice through thy work. I will exult in the works of thy hands. How great are thy works, Yahweh! Thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth it not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked sprang up as the grass, and all the workers of iniquity were flourished, it was that they might be destroyed forever. But thou, Yahweh, art on high forevermore. For Hene, thine enemies, Yahweh, thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my strength thou hast exalted like that of the wild ox. I am anointed with fresh oil. Mine eye hath also seen the defeat of mine enemies. Mine ears have heard the doom of them that rose up against me, doers of evil. The righteous shall spring up like a palm tree. He shall go tall like a cedar in Lebanon. Planted in the house of Yahweh, they shall blossom in the courts of our Elohim. They shall still shoot forth in old age and be full of sap and green to declare that Yahweh is upright. He's my rock, and there's no unrighteousness in him. Barkuit Yahweh Hambarak. Baruk Yahweh Hambarak, the Alamba Ed. Bless ye Yahweh, who's to be blessed. And Bless blessed Yahweh is Yahweh, who's blessed to be blessed forever and ever. With everlasting love, the house love, the house of Yisrael, thy people. The Torah, commandments, statutes, and judgments hast thou taught us. Therefore, Yahweh Elohim, when we lie down and when we rise up, we will meditate on thy statutes. Yea, will rejoice in the words of thy Torah and in thy commandments forever, for they are our life and the length of our days, and we will meditate on them day and night. And mayest thou never take away thy love from us. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, who lovest thy people, Yisrael. Amen. Amalek Nehman, Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, Arum Shem Kavod Malkutu Lilam And thou shalt love Yahweh Eloheka with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. 
And these words which I command this day shall be upon thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon your gates. And it shall come to pass, if shall hearken diligently unto my commandments which I command you this day, to love Yahweh Eloheim and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in its season, the former rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil. And I will give grass in thy field for thy cattle, and thou shalt eat and be satisfied. Take heed to yourself, lest your heart be deceived, and you turn aside and serve other Elohim, and you worship them. And the anger of Yahweh be kindled against you, and he shut up the heavens, and there be no rain, and the land yield not her fruit, and you perish quickly from off the excellent land which Yahweh giveth you. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for frontlets between your eyes, and you shall teach them to your children, talking of them thou sittest in thine house, when the walkest by the way, when the liest stand when thou risest up, and thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon your gates, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children, upon the land which swear, Yahweh swear unto your fathers to give them, as the days of heavens above the earth. And Yahweh spoke unto Moshe, saying, Speak unto the Bnei Israel, and bid them that they make a seat seat upon the corner of their garments throughout their generation. And they put upon the seat seat of each corner a cord of blue. And it shall be unto you for a seat seat. You may look upon it, and remember all the commandments of Yahweh, and do them. And you go not about after your own heart, and after your own eyes, after which you used to go astray, but remember and do all my commandments, and be set apart to your Elohim. I am Yahweh, who brought you, Yahweh Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim to be your Elohim. I am Yahweh Elohim. True and trustworthy is all this, and it's established with us that He is Yahweh Elohim, and there's none beside Him, and that we, Israel, are His people. It is He who redeemed us from the hand of kings, even our King, who delivered us from the grasp of all the terrible ones, Ha'el, who on our behalf dealt out punishment to our adversaries and requited all our mortal enemies, who doeth great things past finding out, and yea, and wonders without number who maintains our souls in life that has not suffered our feet to be moved, who made us overcome and conquer our enemies and exalted our strength above all them that hated us, who wrought for us miracles and vengeance upon Pharaoh, signs and wonders in the land of the children of Ham, who in his wrath smote all the firstborn of Mitzrayim and brought forth his people Yisrael from among them to everlasting freedom who made his children pass through the divided Red Sea, but sank their pursuers and their enemies in its depths. Then his children beheld his might, and they praised and gave thanks unto his name, and willingly accepted his sovereignty. Moshe and the children of Israel sang a song unto thee with great joy, saying all of them, who is like unto thee, Yahweh, among the mighty ones? Who is like unto thee, glorious and set apart in his reverent in praise and doing wonders? Thy children beheld thy sovereign power, as thou didst defy the sea before Moshe, and they exclaimed, Ze'eli anu, this is my El, and said, Yahweh yim lok le'olam ve'el, Yahweh shall reign forever and ever. And it is said, For Yahweh has delivered Yaakov and redeemed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, who has redeemed Israel. Amen. <clears throat> Adonai, open thou my lips and my mouth shall declare thy praise. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, our Elohim. 
Elohim of our fathers, Elohim of Abraham, Elohim of Yitzchak, Elohim of Yaakov, the great, great, mighty, and revered El, Elyon, who bestowest loving kindness, and art master of all things, who rememberest the pious deeds of the patriarchs, and in love will bring a, excuse me, will bring a redeemer to their children's children for thy great name's sake. O King, help our Savior and shield. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, the shield of Abraham. Amen. Thou, Yahweh, art mighty forever. Thou revivest the dead. Thou art mighty to save. Thou causest the wind to blow and the rain to fall. Thou sustainest the living with loving kindness, revivest the dead with great mercy, supportest the falling, healest the sick, freest the bound, and keepeth thy faith to them who sleep in the dust. Who is like unto thee, master of mighty acts, and who resembleth thee our king, who orders death and restores life, and causes salvation to spring forth? A faithful art thou to revive the dead. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, who revives the dead. Amen. Thou art set apart, thy name is set apart, and the Kedoshim praise thee daily. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, the, the set apart elf. Amen. That it sanctify the seventh day unto thy name as the end of creation of heaven and earth. That it's blessed above all days and sanctify it above all seasons. And thus it is written in thy Torah. And the heaven and earth were finished in all their hosts, and on the seventh day Elohim finished his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work which he had made. And Elohim blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it, because he rested thereon from all of his work which Elohim had created and made. Our Elohim and Elohim of our fathers, accept our rest, sanctify us by the commandments, grant our portion in thy Torah, satisfy us with thy excellence. Gladness with thy salvation. Purify our hearts to serve thee in truth. In thy love and grace, Yahweh Eloheinu. Let us inherit thy set-apart Shabbat. And may Yisrael, who sanctifies thy name, rest thereon. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, who sanctifies the Shabbat. Amen. Accept, Yahweh Eloheinu, thy people, Yisrael, in their prayer. Restore the service to the inner sanctuary of thy most set-apart house. Receive in love and grace both the offerings of Israel and their prayer, and may the worship of thy people Israel be ever acceptable unto thee. And let our eyes behold thy return and mercy to Zion. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, who restores thy divine presence to Zion. Amen. We give thanks to thee, for thou art Yahweh, our Elohim, the Elohim of our fathers forever and ever. Thou art the rock of our lives, the shield of our salvation through every generation. We will give thanks unto thee and declare thy praise for our lives, which are committed unto thy hand, for our souls, which are in thy charge, for thy miracles, which are daily with us, and for thy wonders and benefits, which are wrought at all times, evening, morn, and noon. O thou who art all excellent, whose mercies fail not, thou merciful being, whose loving kindnesses never cease, we have ever hoped in thee. For all these acts, thy name, our King, shall be continually blessed and exalted forever and ever, and everything that liveth shall give thanks to thee forever. And shall praise thy name in truth, our El, and our salvation and our help. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, whose name is all excellent, and unto whom it is becoming to give thanks. Grant abundant shalom unto Israel, thy people, forever. For thou art the sovereign master of all shalom. And may it be excellent in thy sight to bless thy people at all times and at every hour with shalom. Blessed art thou, Yahweh, who blesses thy people, Israel, with shalom. Amen. My Elohim, guard my tongue from evil and my lips from speaking guile. To such as curse me, let my soul be dumb. Ye let my soul be unto all as the dust. Open my heart to thy Torah. Let my soul pursue thy commandments. If any design evil against me, speedily make their counsel of no effect and frustrate their designs. Do it for the sake of thy name. Do it for the sake of thy power. Do it for the sake of thy set of partners. Do it for the sake of thy Torah. 
in order that thy beloved ones may be delivered. Save by thy right hand and answer me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable for thee, Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. He who makes shalom in his high places may make shalom for us and for all Israel and say amen. amen. May it be thy will, Yahweh, that the temple be speedily rebuilt in our days and grant our portion in thy Torah. And there we will serve thee with awe as in days of old, as in ancient years. Then shall the offering of Yehudah, of Yerushalayim, and all Yisrael be pleasant unto Yahweh as in days of old, as in ancient years. <clears throat> Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world which he hath created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of all the house of Israel, even speedily and in a near time, and say Amen. Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and ever. Blessed, praised, glorified, exalted, extolled, honored, magnified, and lauded be the name of the set-apart one. Blessed be he. And blessed be his name. Though he be high above all the blessings, hymns, praises, and consolations which are uttered in the world, and say amen. Amen. May there be abundant shalom from heaven and life for us and for all Israel, and say amen. Amen. He who makes shalom in his high places may make shalom for us and for all Israel, and say amen. Amen. And be seated. We're back. Yes, we are. I want to thank everybody for praying with me, for, with all of us. Um, do you have any prayer requests for us today? I don't see any requests that anybody has asked for. Um, okay. We have our regular ongoing list of requests. Um, sure. And I'll, I'll uh, read those again. Maybe someone will come up with a request while I'm doing that. Okay. Uh, Mom is not feeling well again today. She continues to have um, health issues, and um, she's complaining of some stomach pain uh, that's been ongoing for a few days. So uh, okay. she needs some prayers. Uh, continue to pray for uh, Emily, her family, her husband and children. Um our brother Micah, um, I'm not sure if last week's prayer requests are still valid this week, but um, no, he, he still. I understand that he. Uh, I, in fact, I saw a picture. He he got a new car or a new used excellent. car. Excellent, excellent. Well, praise Yahweh. Uh, he answered yeah, that one. Yeah, and uh, I think he's feeling better, but he's still in um, a hard times, so and we need to pray for him. Yes, yes, and um, I understand his back and hip issues are ongoing, so. He probably suffers from pain and, and needs continuous prayer for that. Uh, Sue from uh, YouTube uh, asked for prayers for her son who is in Kosovo. Um, and um, while we're praying for him, I don't know of anyone personally, but I know there are a lot of uh, soldiers involved in the um, war in Israel. Uh, and um, We'll certainly so pray for them. You know, please continue to pray for for them as well. Uh, Kate uh, from YouTube mentions uh, her husband, Dean. Uh, we had asked for, uh, she had asked for prayers last week, and we did pray. And she says uh, that the surgery seemed to resolve the issues. So that's wonderful. Another uh, praise report. And... Uh, just continue to remember our brothers and sisters in prison and uh, our prison work and, and volunteers. Okay. Well, thank you. And we'll certainly pray for all of these. Okay. Yeah, we need uh, to keep in mind, though, that we've got another brother who's having some issues. Mathis? It's, he's on the list there. Uh, I just put, yeah. 
Okay. Great. Right. That's all. We'll do that. Okay. Um, I, I thought maybe I'd address the issue of the prayers that, uh, the standing prayers, the communal prayers that we do. I'm not going to go into great detail because, uh, well, because it's getting late in the day and sunset's coming earlier each week. Pretty soon we'll be having Havdalah together uh, during the service, the separation, the end of the Sabbath. Um, the prayers that we do, uh, the standing prayers from the prayer book, are something we can all do together in unity. Uh, just free prayer and just open prayer is not enough. In the temple, uh, before the Most High in congregations, people sing and give praise, all using the same words. Um, a song of praise to the Most High, uh, whether it be a psalm or something that uh, some other artist has come up with, is a liturgy. It's a prayer, a communal prayer that we all do together to melody. These prayers that we do, uh, a, a large part of them were done during the morning and evening sacrifices in the temple in uh, ancient Israel. Uh, the kernel of them uh, was done there. And some words have been added uh, uh, over the years as has become traditional uh, just to add praise and praise to the Most High. Uh, the last prayer we do, uh, the Kaddish, that was absolutely done in the temple and uh, was generally sung on the steps of the, of the temple. Uh, all Yisrael with one unified, unified voice, just like the angels in heaven in scripture, we here they joined in unity and, and sang and sing before the Most High. Uh, that's why we do these prayers. And uh, there's nothing wrong with them. There's everything right with them. And we, we join our voices, we join our hearts, and we all stand and, and face his temple from wherever you are. Just as Solomon said, if your people, when they've sinned, they turn to you in this place. Uh, and that's what we do. So we do that. We do open prayers and free prayers and we sing uh, all forms of prayer and praise to the Most High. I hope that helps you understand. Uh, they're great prayers. And consider... Uh, morning and evening sacrifice, and if if Yeshua attended the temple services, and we know he did, he participated in these. And so, how can we do less? Okay. Now let's have a prayer for those in need. Father Yahweh, we come before your throne on this your set apart day the day of rest you've commanded for us. Not only did you command us to rest on this day, but to meet together in a set-apart celebration, a mikra kodesh. And you commanded us on this day to remember the exodus from its rhyme and to remember the creation And we've certainly done those things today. We're trying, Father, to be pleasing to you. We do so poorly. Our efforts are so inadequate. But we try. And when we fail, we're going to get up again and try. Because we love you. And we do this together as a people in unity. Because in your word it says that it's precious when brothers dwell together in unity. We hope you accept our prayers. And we hope you answer them. We thank you for hearing our voice and not rejecting us, even though we certainly deserve rejecting. You still hear your people, 
when they cry out to you. We have some needs, Father. Uh, Mom, our matriarch here, she's feeling bad. She's having a hard time. The years catch up with us. Give her ease. We need her here still, Abba. Keep her sharp and heal her. Give her comfort. We pray for those undergoing the, the difficulties in Israel. The horror that's going on in Israel. We know that it's inevitable and that wars will come. They've been in the past according to your word. And they're going to happen in the future according to your word. And some are happening now Let the innocence on, on both sides. Let them find comfort and mercy and safety. As for those who have attacked your people and your nation, even though we know your nation is not what it should be yet, and we know that Messiah is going to is the only answer to correct that. And we know that you've caused a distance between you and your people until the time of Messiah. Still, they're your people. The grafted in the ones that are sons and daughters of Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, the converts, and those people, sojourners, who attach themselves to your people. Have mercy on them, protect them, lift them up, because even though they're not perfect yet, and none of us are, the world looks to them as the people of the book, of the patriarchs. In other words, they represent your name, Abba. Give them victory and protection. Ease their suffering. Comfort the mourners. Reduce the loss of life as best it can be reduced under the circumstances. And rid your land, rid your land of anyone who won't conform to your way and your Torah, anyone who is for war and not for peace. Bring shalom to your land. We pray for Emily again, <clears throat> for her husband and children. Give them well-being and health, and let them turn to you and know you. We pray for our brother Micah, who's still trying to get himself established. We praise your name that he's found a congregation and that he's he seems to be walking so well and lovely according to the Torah. We pray for Sue's son in Kosovo. Give him protection. Keep him safe. Kate's husband, Dean. Give him complete and speedy healing so that he can perform the will and serve you. Our brothers and sisters in prison, 
We thank you so much for relieving them from all this heat and giving them a little bit of comfort and ease. Keep them steadfast in your word. Bring them out to us. Let them join our congregations and our communities. Let them not just be disappointed in us when they do. Help us to help them. Bless the ministry and help anyone who wants to help those of our brothers and sisters who are neglected and in prison or in hospitals or in orphanages or in homes for the elderly or wherever they may be. Bless those people and give them the tools and the strength and the power they need to do that. Place your spirit with them, within them and let them show those people your love, knowledge of you, and bring them to the truth. Watch over our volunteers. They're special, special and precious. They, they go into these places that can give them nothing except peace of mind and, and knowing that they serve you. And they do it week in and week out. And they love their brothers and sisters in prison who they serve. Bless them with a special blessing, Abba. We pray for our brother Mathis. We know he's having trouble. He's still trying to get his feet under him. And he has so many things to deal with. Help him, give him wisdom and knowledge, protection, and forgiveness when he fails, and lift him up. Help him out of his lowest state. We pray for all the new folks who have joined us today, and, and uh, we give you thanks for those who have been with us as well. Give me only the words that you'd have in my mouth to give to them and let them learn and understand and, and draw near to you, all of us. We thank you for this Sabbath. We thank you for this day. We thank you for even being able to come before you and make our petitions known. And we praise your most set-apart name. And we thank you most of all for our salvation and our cleansing and our healing in Yahushua HaMashiach. Because without that, we couldn't even stand before you, Abba. We thank you so much. In his name we pray. I mean. <clears throat> okay. I guess that's, um, that's all we have for today. Thank you for sticking with us and getting through that lesson. An interesting lesson, four commands. And uh, I talked about it for almost two hours. <laughs> uh, cling to his Torah and his word. Be an obedient son, and, son or daughter. Bring esteem to his name rather than profane it in your actions and in what you do. You know, there is one thing that's greater than the commandments. That would be mercy and love and charity. In fact, that's essentially the purpose of the commandments, that, uh, that we learn to care and that we treat each other right and treat him right. And so we do what's commanded. The commandments are only the beginning. In the beginning, remember? And that's what the Torah is. It's just the beginning. It's the basic school child's level of, of observance and obedience to the Most High. And not instead of, but once we've started doing His commandments, 
and we, we've we've become truly Torah observant as best we can uh, where we are. And in this day and age, once we've done that, then we start doing these things that are over and above, and we we understand that you can't do the stuff over and above, the charity, the mercy, and love. It's not over and above until you've done the basic commandments, until you've started at the beginner's level. So, learn the beginner's level, and then, and then do what's even bigger than that. Mercy, charity, and love, and let that be your life. And let that be your witness to the people. Anyway. I've talked enough for one day. Thank you for paying attention. I thank you for putting up with me and all my crazy ideas. Go forth and keep his commandments. We'll start learning some more next week. And add to that your uh, love, charity, and mercy for all people. Shabbat Shalom, and have a great week. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Proceeds from the mouth of Yahweh.